your Bibles this morning and turn to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, this is the passage of Scripture that Gene read just a moment ago. And I want to share with you a message this morning out of the title, This Command to Go and Make Disciples. And uh, as we begin this time here this morning, I just want to say, boy, I enjoyed the, the choir this morning. Thank you, choir, praise team, for just, I love that song. What a God we have. What a God we serve. And Rick, as they were singing that song, I thought of Joel. <laughs> and I was thinking how he might have been at the end of the book coming and sitting down and thinking of those words of that song. And praise team, Sherry, thanks for leading us. We praise God for this. And we just want to go in God's Word this morning and look at this important passage of Scripture. We saw in Acts chapter 2, this early church, the Spirit of God has come down upon them and and it says in that last verse that they're growing and they're multiplying in number and the Lord is adding to the church daily, verse 47, those who are being saved. And then if you go over to chapter 6 of Acts, flip over a few pages in your Bible. And in Acts chapter 6, verse 7, it says, Then the word of God spread and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. Remember that word this morning, multiplied. The church was not growing by addition. It was growing by multiplication. And it says a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. And so these early Christians, and by the way, this is not the only time in like Acts chapter 6 that Dr. Luke here, who's writing this book, gives us one of those verses about the growth of the church. I can share with you about five other verses where he says over and over, and the, and the word of God spread and the church would begin to grow mightily. And it's over and over. And so this is one of those verses. And it just reminds us that the early church was taking seriously this call to go out and make disciples of Jesus Christ. And you remember that was the last words of Christ that He was speaking when He ascended to the Father. He said this in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 and 20. Remember this passage of Scripture? Allow me to turn there this morning. Matthew chapter 28. He says, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Verse 19. Go therefore and do what? And make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. So Christ is speaking here of going and making disciples. And I remind us that that's still the call of the church today, right? That, that's still the call for us here. It's not simply that we can come together in the holy huddle and enjoy awesome music and praise the Lord and have fellowship and sometimes fellowship meals and the singing and, and, hear, and have a Bible study, hear the Word preached. That's all awesome and great. But for the church, there's something much more that God has called us to. And that's to go and make disciples. Leroy Eames, in his book, The Lost Art of Disciple Making, he tells us to visualize a large manufacturing plant in your town that produces shoes. The management of this manufacturing plant, they've invested a lot of money and a lot of employees, a lot of man hours to produce these shoes. So picture this plant. The, the, the plant is in full operation. And people are busy, the machines are going, and everybody's scurrying around. And one day, the president comes up to the production manager and he asks the important question, how many shoes have we produced this last month? And the production manager says, none. <laughs> how many have we produced in the last year? And the production manager says, none. And he says, well, wait a minute, how long have we been in operation? He says, two years. <laughs> two years, and what have we been doing? But the guy says, but the manager says, but listen, we're so busy. In fact, we're so busy that we're all tired out of all the things we've been doing. But they weren't producing any shoes. And that was the purpose of that company. And the church is called to go and make disciples. And the question we ask ourselves this morning, the question I ask myself is, how am I doing? How are we doing at Celebration Church? I want to give you a definition of a disciple, and I believe you would agree with me when we look at the context of Scripture. A disciple is one who seeks to follow Jesus and obey His teachings. And that's the picture we find here in Acts chapter 2 in those verses that we read earlier. But I want you to think with me for a moment as you turn back to Acts chapter 2 and, 
and you begin to look at the, the church growth and how it began to take place, I want to ask the question, how did the disciples, these early disciples, get organized? Because if you go back to verse 41, we find that how many were added to the church? Do you remember that number? 3,000, Alan. It was a huge growth of the church. And so I'm wondering, how did they get organized for the growth to begin to take place? And we, we find here, just a few verses down, in like verse 46, they were continuing with one accord in the temple. They were meeting formally together, perhaps in that large number. But then it says they were breaking bread from house to house. And they were meeting needs in, in those smaller numbers. So I suggest to you that what happened between verse 41 and verse 42, I want to make an assumption here, but I believe it's one that you will agree with me, is that they got together in smaller groups, which I'll call this morning disciple groups. They got together and they ministered to one another. They studied together in these groups. Now, I believe with all of my heart that most Christians sincerely that have the Spirit of Christ in them, they have this burning desire to follow the command of Christ, to go and make disciples. I really believe that. If the Spirit of God lives in you, you desire to, to spread His Word, to share His Word, and be obedient to this call. But I believe that most Christians, and therefore most churches, fall into what I would call a traditional trap. I will call it the, the traditional approach. Most churches fall into this. I, I want to compare this morning the traditional approach with what I see in Scripture is, is a better approach, which what I'll call this morning the disciple multiplication model. Now, think with me for a moment. If you've been in any church for a length of time, maybe you grew up in the church, maybe you can identify with the traditional approach. I, I pastored, the previous church I pastored was a traditional church, and we fell into this so often. The traditional approach says, I, I hope that people will come this coming Sunday to church. I hope people come. And so we would call that the attractional method of church growth or reaching people. And what that does is that puts a heavy emphasis on the preacher and the sermon, puts a heavy emphasis on the choir and the production team. And, and what often happens in the attractional approach is it becomes an attractional means of, of growing the church. And what J. Vernon McGee said years ago, I believe, is so true. It's humorous, but it's a well point. He says, if it takes a circus to get people to come to church, then it probably will take a circus to keep them there. <laughs> probably a lot of truth to that. But now compare this to the disciple multiplication model, which the disciple encourages seekers to visit a service and or a disciple group. Now, the tremendous advantage to this, I believe, is that you already have a built-in prospect list there of those disciples because they're inviting people within their circle of influence. That person they go to school with. That person they're on the ball team with. That person that's in their neighborhood or it's in their family or at the workplace or that they come in contact with on a regular basis. And so we have that built-in prospect list and then therefore there is a personal connection with that person that we're trying to reach and become a disciple for Jesus Christ. I'm going to share the second characteristic of the traditional approach. This says that there, here are some ministry opportunities for the church to be involved with. And so you've been in a church before where the pastor or another ministry leader comes and says, this is a great ministry. <laughs> this is something that we as a church should consider doing. And I'm not discounting for a moment that that's a potentially great ministry in the Lord. But what happens so often is this becomes a, a top-down approach. And there's often a less personal connection with that ministry presentation. And so the pastor obviously wants to get everybody involved, Alex, and get everybody. So oftentimes what takes place is the pastor or leader can use pers persuasion, manipulation, or coercion, and use emotional tactics to get people involved. But the disciple multiplication model says this. That disciple groups uncover ministry and evangelistic needs, oftentimes within their group. That's what was happening here in the scripture in Acts chapter 2, verse 45. We find this amazing verse which says that this, this group of Christians sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. They were, they were compelled by love, not by law, they were compelled by love, love 
to share within their groups. 